Great. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you all had a great lunch. So uh, it's just a quick slide that Dr. Pfeff uh, forgot to introduce in his talk, that there is, a go there is going to be a NASA Sony Rocket Symposium uh, registration open very soon. Uh, if you're interested, you can take a photo of this slide, and then we're going to go to our lighting rounds. All right, uh, we're about to start our second uh, lighting round of the day, which consists of uh, hands-on tutorials of instruments and simulations. All questions will be asked via Slido, and the questions will be answered during the 15-minute joint Q&A panel at the end of the round. So please upload your favorite questions for each speaker as you did for the morning session. All questions not answered today will be answered in the student newsletter. Um, so our first talk is on super down radar given by Dr. Evan Thomas. Uh, Dr. Evan Thomas attended his first CEDAR workshop in Santa Fe, New Mexico in 2011 as a graduate student uh, at Virginia Tech. After complete, co completing his PhD in 2016, Evan moved to Dartmouth College uh, with support from an NSF Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences postdoctoral research fellowship. He's currently a senior uh, research scientist in the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College working in the Superdome HF radar group. Due to the flight cancellation of Dr. Thomas, uh, he will arrive late tonight, uh, but his answer to the questions about the talk will be published through the, through the newsletter. So let's hear uh, for Dr. Thomas pre-recorded uh, waiting. My name is Evan Thomas, and today I'll be giving a tutorial on the Super Dual Auroral Radar Network, or SuperDARN. I'd like to start by just apologizing for not being able to give this tutorial in person. After my flight was canceled yesterday, um, hopefully I'll be in the air and on my way to Austin by the time you're watching this presentation. The Super Dual Auroral Radar Network, or SuperDARN, is an interna international network of ground-based high-frequency radars. These radars operate continuously, measuring Doppler line of sight velocity, backscatter power, and spectral width from decameter scale ionospheric plasma regularities at E and F region altitudes. Some of the typical characteristics of SuperDARN radars include transit mission in the 8 to 20 megahertz frequency band, uh, transmit peak power of about 10 kilowatts or 100 watt on average with the low duty cycle. The radars use a phased ray steering scheme to look in 16 or more azimuthal beam directions with a fixed antenna array. A multi-pulse sequence is used for the simultaneous determination of range information and the Doppler velocity shift. And our typical spatial and temporal resolution are about 45 kilometers in range and one to two minutes in time. So unlike some of the other radar systems you may be hearing about today, the SuperDARN radars operate in the high frequency or HF band. And why do we do that? Why do we operate at such a lower frequency? Well, HF radio waves are refracted as they traverse electron density gradients in the Earth's ionosphere, as shown in this schematic below. So these HF radio waves, as they're traversing the ionosphere, they're slowly bent back towards uh, the ground as they move to higher and higher altitudes. And these HF radio waves can either backscatter towards the radar once they achieve perpendicularity to some magnetic field aligned plasma structures, or they can be fully refracted back towards the ground and return to the radar as a ground, what we call a ground scatter propagation mode. And finally, if the rays are at too high of an elevation angle, they might fully penetrate through the ionosphere and not return back to the radar. So sort of our observational conditions are that the rays need to achieve perpendicularity to these field aligned plasma structures. So the advantages of operating at HF are that the refraction of our transmitted signals allows us to access targets in the F region ionosphere, where a straight line propagation would not be able to achieve perpendicularity to these plasma structures. This refraction allows the bending and sort of bouncing back and forth between the ground and the ionosphere of our signals to extend our uh, typical observational range out to 3,000, sometimes in excess of 5,000 kilometers. And the low power requirements associated with HF operation allow the radars to operate continuously, meaning that they're making measurements 24 hours a day, every day of the year. These two figures show the fields of view of the super darn radars in the northern hemisphere on the left and the southern hemisphere on the right in geomagnetic coordinates, 
where the actual radar locations are given by the black circles and crosses, and the nominal fields of view of each radar are indicated by those color-coded um, triangles, where the reddish-orange corresponds to the mid-latitude radars, blue the auroral zone or high-latitude radars, and green the so-called polar radars at even higher latitudes. So the original array of Superdawn radars were those blue colored radars overlooking the auroral zone and into the polar cap. Over the last two decades, the network has expanded to these mid-latitude and polar sites to better observe the expansion of the high latitude convection pattern under more disturbed geomagnetic conditions, and also to better resolve features within the polar cap, particularly during um, IMF BZ northward conditions, where we have some interesting reverse convection cells, and also with features like polar cap patches. This is a chronological list of the principal investigator or PI institutions which operate the Superdarn radars. You can see that the first radar was constructed by Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in 1983, and subsequently many more countries have joined the network, with currently about 35 radars in operation managed by 18 different PI institutions from 10 different countries, meaning that this really is a international collaboration. And there are still more radars being constructed even as we speak um, to offer different additional coverage in uh, within China at equatorial latitudes and also at Dartmouth College, we're in the process of building a new pair of radars in Iceland. So this slide shows photographs of the original high latitude radar sites where you can see the radar antennas are on top of these tall towers and the actual antennas themselves are these log periodic elements uh, that are oriented horizontally on top of these towers. Uh, each radar typically has 16 antennas in the front in the main array for both transmit and receive and a secondary smaller antenna array in the rear or receive only to help us resolve elevation angles of the uh, observed signals. More recently, the Superdarn radars have shifted away from the log periodic antenna design to a so-called twin terminated folded dipole or wire antenna design. So this is an aerial photo of the Fort Hayes um, radar site in Hayes, Kansas. These radars were constructed in 2009 they're operated by Virginia Tech. And here you can see that there's both an eastward and westward uh, radar, pair of radars located at the same site, where in the front we have the two main arrays, which are used for both transmit and receive. And then located about 100 meters behind each of the two main arrays is this secondary interferometer array, which is used for the receive only um, to resolve the vertical angle of arrival or elevation angles of the measurements. So you can't actually see the antennas in this photograph because there are these really tiny wires, but they're being held up by these very tall traffic, traffic pole type structures that you can see in this photo. So earlier I mentioned that we use phased array steering to look in different azimuthal beam directions without actually steering any physical components of our radars. Uh, these two figures just show the simulated radiation patterns of the newer wire antenna designs that I just showed for that Fort Hayes radar site. So on the left, this is a simulation of the azimuthal beam pattern, and on the right is the elevation pattern of those TTFD antennas. And this was as, done as part of the master's thesis work of Kevin Stern at Virginia Tech. So you can see that on the left, our beam width in terms of azimuth is fairly narrow, which gives us good angular resolution for resolving convection. But on the right, our beam width in terms of elevation is fairly broad. And this is actually useful because we don't know the optimal propagation paths of our radio waves through the ionosphere. It's heavily dependent on the ionospheric densities, um, any other disturbances that might be propagating through the radar field of view. So we want to be launching our radar signal over as broad of an elevation um, window as possible so we can take advantage of all those different refractive paths through the E and F layers of the ionosphere. I have spent a lot of time so far describing the Superdarn radar's operating characteristics and their physical design. So now let's look at some actual data. And just as a reminder, the animation on the right is a simple cartoon showing how the radars perform a typical scan, where they in integrate along each azimuthal beam direction for about three seconds to measure line of sight parameters like velocity, power, and spectral width before advancing to the next beam, 
completing a full scan every minute. And now on the left, I'm showing an example of line of sight Doppler velocities measured during a single scan by the Christmas Valley East radar in Oregon, where positive velocity values indicate plasma motion toward the radar, negative values indicate motion away from the radar, and gray colored pixels have been flagged as possible ground scatter, or in other words, likely not coming from an ionospheric plasma regularity, but instead bouncing off the ground. Each successive panel in this figure on the left shows line of sight velocity data from the same radar at one hour intervals, where we can see the appearance of a narrow plasma flow channel initially directed towards the radar at about 5 UT, but moving away from the radar several hours later at 7 UT, as these pixels within the center of the field of view change from bright blue to green to reds to yellows. So this change could be due to either a variation in the plasma flow direction, or more likely because the radar has rotated with the Earth and is now viewing the feature from a different line of sight direction, meaning that the line of sight velocity component will have a different sign. So we have lots of different radars making these line of sight measurements, um, which can be done for a lot of really useful studies, looking at traveling ionospheric disturbances, subaural polarization streams, um, meteor winds in the Earth's mesosphere and lower atmosphere, um, solar flare effects on the ionosphere. But what SuperDARN is probably most known for is the process by which we combine all these different line of sight measurements from all the radars in the network, as indicated by these little circles with um, tails um, marking the direction of the plasma flow. And we take all these global measurements and we can use different assimilative schemes to combine them to resolve a global two-dimensional plasma circulation pattern or convection pattern. So this is just an example where we've used the map potential technique of Rahanam and Baker to um, perform a spherical harmonic fitting to all of these different line site measurements with a background statistical model to fill in regions where we don't have coverage and produce this two-dimensional um, large-scale um, circulation pattern, which you might notice this is a just an instantaneous map um, on a given day that this broadly you know, matches up with this classical um, picture of two cell convection um, dating back to uh, the early work by uh, Dungey et al. So we can make these measurements not only, you know, not only do this processing um, for historical events, but also for a lot of these radar sites, we're collecting data in real time. So this is just an example of a real time convection pattern that we produce with data from many different northern hemisphere sites. And this can be a really powerful tool for space weather monitoring purposes, and also um, in support of sounding rocket campaigns and other experiments. So how do you get access to SuperDARN data? Um, there are a couple different places you can obtain it. One is the data mirror at the British Antarctic Survey, where you can use SSH and RSync after you've applied for an account. There is a archive at the Federated Research Data Repository in Canada, with all of the raw files up through, I think, 2020 <clears throat> with uh, in yearly archives, where each yearly archive has its own citable digital object identifier, or DOI. And I'd just like to emphasize that while SuperDARN does have an open data use policy, we really strongly encourage users to reach out to any principal investigators or their groups if you plan to use their data in a study, because sometimes there can be some special caveats or, you know, issues with the data that you might not be aware of in terms of maintenance or other things. Um, so just, we really recommend that users reach out to these PIs um, to make sure that the data are being interpreted correct, correctly and make sure proper citations and acknowledgement are included in any study. The primary data processing and analysis package for SuperDARN data is the Radar Software Toolkit, or RST, which allows you to process the raw data files and obtain the fitted line of sight measurements and combine those data from many different sites to obtain the global convection patterns. There's documentation for installing the RST and performing those processing steps available at this read the docs link. And there's also documentation for the C command line functions available at the GitHub page. There are also two Python uh, software libraries for reading and plotting SuperDARN data. The first is PyDARN IO, which allows you to open and read SuperDARN data files. And here are links to the Zenodo, GitHub, and documentation pages. 
Second is PyDARN, which is a data visualization library for SuperDARN data, which allows you to use, um, coupled with PyDARN IO, you can read the files, and then with PyDARN, you can plot the line of sight data and the convection data. This slide has a lot of useful links to the SuperDARN GitHub repository, the Zenodo community where users are starting to upload their files and code when they're publishing papers with SuperDARN data. I've got links here to the four US SuperDARN PI institutions, Dartmouth College, Johns Hopkins, APL, Penn State, Virginia Tech, and also links to a couple of our international colleagues' websites, in particular SuperDARN Canada, SuperDARN Japan, and at La Trobe University in Australia. So you can find different online plotting tools and references and tutorials and contact info at many of these different SuperDARN pages. So I encourage you to check those out. So with that, I won't be able to take any questions now, um, but please hang on to them and hopefully I'll be able to answer them for you later in the week. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your CEDAR student day. Uh, our big thanks to Dr. Thomas, who was able to quickly record his talk for us. Uh, next, we have two back-to-back -back tutorials given by Dr. Brian Harding. The first tutorial is on meteoradar and imagers, and the second talk is on icon and swarm data. Dr. Brian Harding received his PhD in 2017 from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Following a postdoc at Illinois, he moved to Berkeley as an assistant researcher at the Space, Science, Space Sciences Laboratory in 2019. His, his experience includes instrumentation, uh, data analysis, and photochemical and radiative transfer modeling, always a focus on the dynamics of the thermosphere and ionosphere. His main, his main research projects lately include studying low-latitude uh, low electrodynamics with ICON and SWARM, and developing three new FPIs to the Southwest US. Let's welcome Dr. Brian Hardy. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, you all should feel free to just call me Brian. It doesn't have to be Dr. Hardin. Okay, so I know I'm giving two back-to-backs. Um, I've actually just combined them into one talk here on uh, ground and space-based data sources. And the theme that I want to try to uh, bring up is that it's important to understand your sampling. So I don't have any slides, but what I have here is I've developed a Jupyter notebook. Uh, for those of you that use Python, um, you can hop on over to this GitHub page, which um, you should have the link to. If not, it's on the agenda. Uh, if you go down here, you can open up this uh, code in what's called Google Colab, which is, it runs in the cloud, and there's code here to download the data, and uh, you can make your own plots, and it runs on, uh, you just have to log into a Google account. So I, I invite you to try that. Um, if you do that, go ahead and click View, Expand Sections. For some reason, it collapses all the code cells. Okay, so I'll just be presenting from here. So I was tasked with discussing um, meteor radars, all sky imagers, Fabry Pro interferometers, and ICON and Swarm. So that's a lot, and I won't be able to cover everything in 30 minutes. Um, but e even this isn't everything, so uh, I don't want to give the impression that these are the only useful data sets. This leaves out some important ones. Um, for example, Timed has been a workhorse of this community for 20 years and continues to do that. Uh, Gold is a modern uh, new mission as well. My focus here on ICON and Swarm uh, is uh, definitely biased towards my own in interests in low latitude electrodynamics, but I do truly believe that we're in something of a, a golden age of electrodynamics um, with ICON and Swarm up at the same time. You can actually, we have information on all of the terms in the generalized Ohm's law. Um, so it's, a, it's an exciting time, and there's a lot to do. Um, as I mentioned, I won't be able to get into all the details. There's really some great references on previous tutorials. Some folks really uh, put in a lot of work, so I recommend that you uh, take a look at those. As well as just a, a personal recommendation, uh, dissertations I found to be a really useful resource for understanding background that I think are really underutilized. Um, we should really be referencing dissertations more. Anyway, for each data set um, here, I'm not really going to tell you much about how it works because I don't think most people need to know that to be able to do science with it. I'm also not going to tell you what you can do with the data because that changes for each science project. 
Um, what I will focus on, though, is what parameter is being sampled, okay, and then other aspects of the sampling that are important, that what I call the trajectory of the measurement through space-time, and I'll talk about what I mean by that, uh, the averaging of the measurement across space-time, which is something that's not often quantified as an error source in our field, but really is, uh, and finally, other error sources. Um, in undergrad, we learn a lot about the mathematics of how you should analyze your data when noise is a Gaussian distribution, or so-called white noise. Um, in CDAR data sets, and in fact in most geophysics data sets in general, the noise is not Gaussian, with some exceptions. Uh, and so it's, it's rather systematic. Um, follows some non-Gaussian distribution that's often correlated across time and space. So I'll try to mention that as well. Okay, so let's jump right in. Um, first up, meteor radar, and let me just go ahead and say, uh, Ryan Voltz last year gave a really great talk on meteor radar, so here's a link to the YouTube video. Uh, I recommend you check that out for more, but I'll just go through this briefly. So here's a graphic uh, meteor radar that I uh, took courtesy of Cookie Chow. So uh, meteor radars, and in particular specular meteor radars, sample the, the neutral wind, and they do that by looking at uh, meteors. So you go out on a clear night, you're bound to see a couple meteors up in the sky, but really there's hundreds of thousands. Um, I know that the Hikamarka Radio Observatory, which is uh, probably our most sensitive instrument, can look up in a one degree by one degree field of view, looking straight up, and it sees four meteor trails per second. Okay, so that's a lot of data to be mined. Uh, so the principle of operation, uh, when the meteor comes in, it usually ablates around 80 to 105 kilometers, uh, leaves a plasma trail. That plasma trail almost immediately begins drifting with the neutral wind. Uh, under the right conditions, a radio wave will bounce off of that plasma trail. When it comes back to you, you get a slightly different frequency than what you sent, and that's because it was Doppler shifted. So when you collect enough meteors from an area above you here, uh, you may notice that the meteors in this direction have a positive Doppler shift, the meteors in this direction have a negative Doppler shift, and these are near zero. What you would conclude from that is that the wind is blowing this way. So uh, that's the principle of operation. The measurement trajectory, well, it's fixed to the Earth, uh, but it's resolved in altitude. Uh, unlike optical instruments, radars can do range gating, so you can resolve the different altitudes, get a profile of the winds from around 80 to 105 kilometers. In terms of averaging, it's variable. Uh, it depends on how long you decide to sit there and collect meteors before you try to estimate the wind. But roughly speaking, uh, 200 kilometers horizontally, that's about two degrees, latitude, longitude. Two kilometers vertically and 30 Along minutes in time. Along the way from Earth to outer. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about errors too. Um, Radar is actually pretty precise, okay? So uh, they don't have a, a large amount of systematic errors, but the ones that do exist, uh, one, of, one of them is, uh, depending on the interferometric uh, radar they have on the receive side, um, you may not be able to exactly spatially register every Doppler shift. So there might be some altitude uncertainty or smearing involved. Um, and finally, the biggest error source is probably assumptions used in the analysis. So it, again, each meteor is only a line of sight wind. How do you turn that into a horizontal wind? Well, often you assume spatial homogeneity, so no gradients, although various techniques exist to uh, resolve that as well. Okay, so meteor radars have been around for a long time. Uh, one of the exciting things that's been happening recently, uh, especially led by uh, Koki Chow's group, is to deploy these meteor radars in networks. It's called the multi-static meteor radar technique, and using that, you can um, transmit uh, from one transmitter that reaches multiple receivers from different aspect angles and try to resolve what's going on inside the field of view to maybe actually resolve some small-scale gravity waves like we heard about this morning. I'll just show one quick example. Here is from a deployment of uh, multi-static meteor radars in northern Germany, and each of the colors is a different altitude from uh, 85 to 95 kilometers, and uh, the spatiotemporal structure you can see is indicated by the trailing lines and there's just a whole lot of information that's probably not even resolved yet. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, on this front. It's exciting. Okay, uh, let's move on to optics. Now, before I get into 
talking about Fabry Pro interferometers and uh, all sky imagers, let me just talk a little bit about Airglow. So this is just a simple movie from uh, taken from the space station. Not really a fancy camera here. I think this is just your standard Nikon camera. Uh, so you immediately see there's the aurora here, your greens. Uh, if the light wasn't shining right on there, you could see some reds up here at the top too. We're familiar with that. But you also notice there's the same kind of emissions that happen everywhere on the globe. Now, they're not excited by the same processes. It's not particle precipitation that's exciting these emissions. But um, various other types of chemistry can lead to the same electronic transitions uh, that uh, glow in those colors. And that's important because this is a region of the atmosphere that's hard to measure. I mean, the ionosphere is hard to measure. The thermosphere is even harder to measure. Um, and this area between 100 and 200 kilometers is even harder than that. But we do have some information from these naturally occurring emissions that we can use. Um, so the point I want, one point I want to make is just that um, each one of these emissions, here is a, a spectrum uh, of the night glow emission, you know, what you'd get if you were able to put this light through a prism and see what uh, wavelengths it's made of, has these distinct peaks, unlike sunlight. So there's oxygen emissions at uh, the green line, the red line, there's a sodium emission, a bunch of stuff in the infrared, usually from OH. When you want, it's, when you want to interpret one of these data products, you kind of have to delve into the photochemistry of how it, how it works. Um, so that makes the interpretation difficult, but measurements are super cheap, okay? Most of these cameras are just cameras, albeit cooled. The two that I'll be f most focused on here are the so-called green line emission at uh, 557.7 nanometers and the red line emission at 630 nanometers. Uh, right, okay. So on to all sky imagers. Uh, once again, Ostibot gave a great talk last year at the student day, so here's a link to that YouTube video. Uh, I recommend you check that out. Uh, all sky cameras are nothing except a a camera with a fisheye lens on top looking up in the sky. Okay, so you take a picture from the ground looking up. The different wavelengths give you information about different altitudes. Um, and depending on your uh, pixel size, it can give you information about different kinds of waves or what have you. So the parameter measured here is the air glow intensity. That's the integral of the emission rate. Uh, I already described the principle of operation. The trajectory is fixed to the earth. Importantly, it's resolved horizontally, um, but not resolved vertically. So you look up, and not only do you scramble together all the information from the different altitudes, you also sometimes don't know what altitude you're looking at. Uh, the red line is usually stays around the same place, more or less, and it's wide, but the green line and those other narrow emissions down in the mesosphere and lower thermosphere are particularly problematic uh, because they're so narrow that when you see a change, you see something change in your data, you don't know whether it's because something actually changed or the air glow layer was going up and down. Uh, an integration of seconds to minutes. Some error sources you might run, run across, uh, difficult to absolutely calibrate, so most, most science that's done with air glow imagery is done with relative values, looking at perturbations, not trying to do any um, absolute, say, density measurements, although there are people that, that do that well. And then the real problem with ground-based measurements is clouds, the moon, atmospheric absorption, atmospheric scattering. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned, the, the trade-off is it's cheap. Okay, so how do you get the data? Well, um, I forgot to mention this with meteor radars, but same goes for the imagers. Uh, the instruments are often operated independently by different groups, different data sets. It's kind of a pain. Uh, but the, the good news is many providers will make data freely available uh, with no registration, especially for these all sky imagers, and they're happy to help. So just uh, reach out, uh, especially at this conference, people are quite friendly, so please do that. I just wanted to give one example. The Boston University runs an excellent um, and well calibrated set of imagers. Uh, and they have a nice chain here going from north uh, to south along the uh, given longitude sector. Yeah, it's a really great uh, resource. So check out their website. Uh, to use this data. I just want to give one example, and this was actually a paper that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago on one of my favorite topics, which is uh, the subaurural ionosphere, and in particular, the Steve aurora. 
So this is a, a AllSky imager. Okay, this is actually putting together different wavelengths, so that's why you could see the resolve different colors. Uh, let's let it wait till the beginning again. Okay, so first you see this diffuse red uh, band going across the sky. That's typically what we would have called a SAR arc. Okay, it's thought to be generated by heat conduction from uh, the magnetosphere, especially inter uh, interactions that go on in the plasma sphere boundary. That heat conducts down through the electron gas and uh, excites red emission, but no other kinds of emission. Stable auroral red arc. Okay, a few things though. This doesn't look stable. Um, it's not really auroral because it's not energetic precipitation. And then look what happens later. It appears to turn into something that looks an awful lot like the observations of Steve. If you're not familiar with Steve, just look, look it up. Um, lots of good articles out there. Uh, Steve is a sub strong thermal emission velocity enhancement. It's a backronym. Okay, so this is really exciting, I think, because uh, the processes that we think cause SAR arcs and the processes that we think cause Steve are not related, but clearly this two-dimensional data set shows that there's some relation. It looks like SAR arc turns into Steve. And this is not something you could do unless you had two-dimensionally temporally, two-dimensionally resolved temporal images. You, try, you would never be able to see this from a moving um, platform. Okay, I'll stop geeking out about Steve. Okay, on to Fabry Pro interferometers. So Fabry Pro interferometers, and really any interferometers, um, I, I just focus on Fabry Pro interferometers. That's what I did for my dissertation work. Uh, they're basically just narrow field cameras looking up at the air glow emission. But on the bottom, right before you measure the emission, you put an interferometer there in front of the camera. So the principle of operation is that when the light comes in, you have it interfere with itself. Light bounces around, partially transmitted, uh, collected through a lens to focus on one spot. Depending on the wavelength, that light's either going to constructively interfere with itself, destructively interfere with itself, or somewhere in the middle. And as you change the, the angle, that comes in, you change the conditions that lead to that interference, and so you get this ring pattern. Much like the meteor radar, when the wind blows, it Doppler shifts the emission. A very tiny amount, okay? Uh, the ratio of the wind speed to the speed of light. We're talking 10 to the minus 6, or 10 to the minus 8 even. Okay, but it is detectable with a stable system. Um, just, just for reference, these plates have to, usually are about a centimeter and a half apart, they have to be parallel to within lambda over 100, okay, which is like 10 to the minus 9 meters. And uh, if you change the, the uh, separation of the plates by 20 nanometers, say like the temperature in the room goes up a little bit or I accidentally step on something outside, that looks like a, a 20 meter per second wind. So um, this is important a little later when it comes to errors. Okay, so it, uh, parameter measured is the neutral wind and the neutral temperature. I didn't mention the temperature too much, but the width of the fringes gives you the spectral broadening, which is the temperature. Uh, the trajectory is uh, fixed to the Earth. Now, that's not entirely, there was one FBI that was flown on the DE2 satellite. Uh, we don't often uh, use that much anymore, although I'm not sure why. Uh, you don't really resolve altitude information. A single measurement is ascribed to one altitude or maybe an average over a range of altitudes. The averaging is a few kilometers horizontally, although uh, Mark Conde runs these scanning Doppler imagers that you heard about a little bit earlier today, where you actually have like a fisheye lens looking up at the aurora. They have plenty of signals, so they can actually resolve the uh, horizontal variations, horizontal gradients in the winds, uh, and temporal integrations of seconds to minutes. Now, with any interferometer, uh, what I like to say is precision is easy, but accuracy is hard. The largest errors in this, and as I mentioned, many other CDAR data sets are systematic. It's easy to measure changes in the wind. It's hard to know what the wind actually is. So you don't know what your zero is, for example. Um, and then there's the other issues that plague almost any ground-based site, such as clouds, atmospheric scattering, et cetera. Uh, be very careful interpreting vertical winds from FPIs. 
They're often a lot smaller than horizontal winds, so any small errors get amplified. Uh, vertical winds with FPIs is uh, a long-standing topic of debate. Okay, so like the meteor radars, and a sort of exciting thing that's been happening in the past decade has been that the FPIs have been deployed not just standalone, but in networks. So here's a map of a few networks that, that I've been involved with, uh, a network in the eastern United States that um, was in its heyday about five years ago, um, a two FPI network in Brazil, and then a new network that um, I helped develop, uh, deploy out here in the western US just uh, several months ago. I don't want to give the impression that this is it, though. There's other people that run FPIs. These, these are just the ones I'm most familiar with. OK, I'll just give one quick example. Something you can start to do with those networks is to resolve uh, horizontal variations. So this is an example from a paper by Rafael Mesquita uh, looking at variations in the wind, how they change, and relating convergences and divergences in the wind to changes in the, the Doppler temperature, uh, which is um, representation of the, the neutral temperature. Okay, now on to ICON. Um, a lot of the work that I've done the past few years has been ICON. Uh, ICON has four instruments, seven level two data products, two currently released level four uh, model data products with more coming, so I don't have time at all to go into the details. Joanne Wu has put together a nice introduction with some code of how to read and process ICON data. Check that out. Here's a CoLab link, link right here. There's more references for you, to, for you all to look at. Uh, in my time here, uh, you can already sense my focus on the neutral wind, so I'll focus mostly on MITEI and the neutral wind data product. So MITEI is really like an FPI that's in space. It's actually a Michelson interferometer, but the principle is the same. Uh, it sits up here at 600 kilometers, mounted an icon, and looks horizontally across the horizon. Um, this image is not to scale. Uh, icon is really only at, in low Earth orbit, so just about down here to scale. There's two, there's actually two sensors on MITEI, MITEI A and MITEI B, so when MITEI A is looking out on the horizon, seeing a Doppler shift out here, uh, five to eight minutes later, MITEI B is looking at that same point, and so you can actually resolve uh, both components of the horizontal wind. There's no ambiguity of line of sight wind like we talked about with the other instruments. Right, so MITEI measures the neutral wind, uh, its principle of operation is, as I said, similar to an FPI. Now here's where it gets interesting. The measurement trajectory is in low Earth orbit. So you're, when you see your data change, you don't know if that's because the atmosphere changed or you changed where you were looking at. And I'll get into more details about that later. Uh, MITEI provides winds from 90 to 300 kilometers. So unlike a ground-based instrument, you can actually uh, scan and get altitudinal information. That is actually, I think, one of the most uh, the most important contributions that MITEI makes to the, the data set we have available. But here's the problem. Uh, MITEI averages horizontally. When you look out on the horizon, depending on how you calculate it, um, you're averaging somewhere from 500 to 1,200 kilometers. You miss all of those waves that Corin was so excited about this morning. Um, but you get the vertical resolution. OK, error sources. Um, you know, because MITEI is in space and because so much money went into its development, um, there aren't as many systematic errors as some of the ground-based instruments, but there still are some. Uh, I don't have time to get into it, so just check out the, check out the papers uh, that I've listed below. There's also data gaps to worry about in the South Atlantic anomaly. Uh, you don't have, uh, the radiation environment is too harsh to allow good data sources, and then, of course, where there's no air glow, there's no data, so at night, between 110 and 210 kilometers, as exciting as that part of the atmosphere is, we just don't have data from there at night. Okay, finally, swarm. So um, swarms, SWARM is a European Space Agency mission. Uh, its primary instruments are a magnetometer and a Langmuir probe. So here I really just have time to focus on the magnetometer, which provides current estimates, electric current estimates. estimates. Here's a map from uh, Sabaka et al. 2015, looking at height integrated currents in the ionospheric dynamo region. You'll often see this referred to as the SQ current system. Generally, you get a, a counterclockwise 
current in the northern hemisphere and a clockwise current in the southern hemisphere. Here at the equator, you notice all these lines converge. There's actually a really strong current due to the uh, enhanced cowling effect at the uh, magnetic equator called the equatorial electrojet current, or EEJ. Here's a model result from one of uh, Yosuke Yamazaki's papers in 2014. This is a latitude cut at a constant longitude uh, from, uh, uh, I believe this is the Gaia model. Um, and you can see the SQ currents here on the lobes, but the really strong current here at the equator between about 100 to 120 kilometers is the electrojet. And that's really a key current because as the electrojet goes, so goes the low latitude electric field. So it's kind of a bellwether. Now, as Swarm, which is flying up here at 400 kilometers, flies over top of this current, um, from the Bios of Art law, you should see a change in the magnetic field as you fly over. This black line is from a paper by Patrick Alkin, who develops the EEJ product for Swarm. The black line is that measurement. And you can see there's broad changes that have to do with other internal and external currents. But what we're focused on here is this dip. Okay? And by uh, running an estimation procedure and basically trying to invert Bios of Arla, uh, you can come up with an estimate of the equatorial electrojet intensity, the height integrated current. Okay, so that's the parameter that's measured. I already explained the principle of operation. <clears throat> Trajectory, again, low Earth orbit. You only get one latitude profile every equator crossing, and every time you do it, you're at a different longitude. Okay. Um, I get the sense I'm running low on time. The timer isn't going, but uh, feel free to stop me if I'm going over. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this to you to read. Plenty of um, references on there, uh, as well as a really nice uh, data visualization tool that um, they've put together. So check out that link here. Okay, now I want to talk about one example of why sampling is so important and related to tides and planetary waves that we heard about this morning. Uh, so I'm going to focus on low Earth orbit. And you'll hear these words um, like synoptic, asynoptic sampling, UT sampling, local time sampling. So I want to explain a little bit about what that means. Here's your expression for any kind of global wave, such as a tide that you saw this morning. Amplitude, cosine term. The phase term has a, a term that changes with time. That's a, that's a temporal frequency. A term that changes in space. Lambda here is your longitude and radians. That's your spatial frequency, which people often call wave number, confusingly. Um, here's a, a constant phase offset. So many of the, the sort of zoo of tides fit into this framework. So here I've made a little, little graphic of uh, whatever your Let me try to get this on the same page. Okay, so for a given n, which is uh, temporal frequency, and a given s, which is spatial frequency, uh, this tells you what tide you're looking at. And this is that jargon. You heard of DE3 was a, an important one, especially uh, for the low latitude electrodynamics. Uh, terms that are in the diagonal here are so-called migrating tides, where n equals s. And planetary waves also fit into this, but they just have frequencies, temporal frequencies that are fractions, okay? But same math holds. Now, if you're in the ground, your lambda is a constant. Okay, that means that um, that constant can be absorbed into the phase term. When you see a variation from the ground, you're measuring n, and it's a combination of all of the different s's that could be contributing. However, if you're in space, this is an example of a low Earth orbit. This is like what it would look like if you're look at the sun looking back at the the spacecraft, when it comes back around to the same latitude, it's at the same local time, right? This looks like it's around 11 a.m., a little bit before uh, noon. So let's rewrite this equation. Local time is just your, your actual time plus a term that depends on longitude, right? If I go 15 degrees east, I'm an hour later. Plug that into the equation, and you see this S minus N that um, you saw this morning. Since local time is constant, this term, is cosine s minus n times lambda, means that you see the frequency of the wave, the wave number, but it's Doppler shifted by Earth's rotation, n. So this is something that confused me for like two years in grad school, why they call DE3 a wave four, but that's the reason, it's because s minus n is four. 
Okay, so I have some example code here. Um, I'm gonna go through uh, part of it briefly and I'll leave it to you to go, to go through the rest. One, if you're gonna take one practical takeaway from my talk, I just wanna um, mention that uh, the packages of pandas and X-Array are extremely useful for um, doing any kind of data processing in our field. Um, I wasted so much time in grad school coding up everything myself with NumPy arrays. Don't do that. Th these people have figured that out for you. Okay, so this code will go through and download a day of Mighty Data, Meteor Radar Data, uh, uh, Swarm Data, and Icon IBM, which I didn't have a chance to talk about, but you can check this out later. So what I wanna do is just show just a couple plots. Um, this, I provided some code here to read the Mighty Data and put it to an X-Array data set. You can see it's the zonal wind, meridional wind as a function of time and altitude. And let's just look at 105 kilometers. This is all the data from a given day. It kind of looks like a mess. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on one latitude, like I mentioned earlier. If you do that, select just a, an altitude, a latitude range and plot the data, you can see something that looks maybe like a wave four. But to determine that, I have some code here that does some uh, periodogram analysis. Uh, Lone Scargle periodogram is like an FFT for unevenly sampled data. And you can see right there, uh, there's a large wave four component in this day of data. There's also a wave, looks like 1.3 or 1.5, which um, you can read about down here later on your own. Um, the thing is, this wave four fit that I mentioned only tells you that S minus N is equal to four. Right, so it could be any one of these waves that we see on this day, right? Spatial planetary wave, a stationary planetary wave, DE3, SE2, TE1. So what you really want is a ground-based site to be able to tell you what row of this table you're sitting on, okay? So I think I'm out of time. Um, I'll let you go through this on your own. Um, we have some meteor radar data that looks for diurnal tides. We have some swarm data where you can also see a wave four in the ele equatorial electrojet, suggesting that the low latitude electric field is indeed responding to this wave four that's in the winds. And we're sort of closing the, the story on generalized Ohm's law for global scale waves. And I'll leave it to you as a homework problem to find any impact in the ionospheric densities. This is icon density data from that day. Um, so try it out. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, for the wonderful tutorials. Now we have, and special thanks for combining all the previous tutorials. Now we have a series of the instrument tutorials to, for our reference, and we even have a homework for that. Uh, next, we're going to have a tutorial on GDC given by Dr. Douglas Rowland. Dr. Douglas Rowland is the chief of the Ionosphere, Thermosphere, Mathosphere Physics Laboratory in the Helios, Phys Helios Physics Sex, uh, Science Division at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, his research interests include the dynamics of the upper atmosphere and the coupling of the magnetosphere to the ionosphere. Dr. Rowland previously served as the mission scientist for the ICON Explorer uh, mission, as the project scientist for the s phase A concept study, and as the deputy PI for the MIM-X or MIM-10 uh, phase A concept study. Dr. Rowland led the first NASA Goddard CubeSat mission, Firefly, which operated for four years on orbit and has developed experiments for small satellites and the International Space Station, as well as over 17 sounding rockets payloads. Let's welcome Dr. Rowland. Well, thank you so much to the conveners for uh, inviting me here and letting me give you a talk about GDC. The reason I'm so excited is because GDC is a new mission. I look forward to 10 years from now when we have a hands-on tutorial and we can get out the Jupyter notebooks or whatever Jupyter 2030 will be and uh, get to use of the data. So we're still in the early planning stages, but I'm excited to be here because this is our first public talk at a conference about this mission. We've had talks from the previous uh, sort of study teams, but now that we have a science team and instruments and so on already selected, this is our first public talk. So I look forward to 10 years from now when we're all sitting here 
Many of you will be the leaders on this mission in a decade time when we actually have something flying in space. So let's see here. Okay. So what is GDC? GDC was recommended by the Decadal Survey in 2013. This was a mission, Geospace Dynamics Constellation is sort of, you take it apart, you can tell what it is. It's a constellation of multiple satellites to understand the dynamics of the upper atmosphere. And the key there is the word dynamics, meaning we want to quantify. We're past sort of the discovery phase of saying, hey, the atmosphere is hot here, it's cold there. We want to understand why it's hot, why it's cold, why it moves, and really follow those uh, dynamical forcings throughout the entire system. The science and definition team came up with a two major science goals. They're directly related to the tutorials you saw today. There's goal one is how the high latitude ionosphere thermosphere system responds to magnetospheric energy input. And goal two is a, global, is a global goal. It's how does the internal processes redistribute that energy that's put in at high latitudes. And uh, you had a tutorial about that as well today. So if you look at sort of all the different topics we're talking about here at CEDAR this week, GDC touches on a lot, but not all of them, obviously. Uh, there's sort of a, a nice diagram here that came from the Decadal Survey. And GDC is really a mission to characterize the global dynamics of the upper atmosphere for the first time. In addition to global dynamics, it can provide these critical observations of space-time separation. We saw data from Swarm. Brian just gave a really nice discussion of how sampling really limits you or, or can enable certain pro problems. In this case, GDC is going to try to disambiguate those spatiotemporal variations using multiple satellites that are spread out horizontally and making those, those time-space measurements. These are energy inputs, solar energy input, electromagnetic energy input, and energetic charge particle input are the main ones that the GDC is studying. Of course, there's also critical input from the lower atmosphere, and that's what you're gonna hear a lot about later this week, and you heard about it in the tutorials earlier. That's gonna be the focus of the dynamic mission. We also have great missions, ICON, gold, timed, that are studying that sort of, and awe, I forgot to put on awe, that are studying that lower atmosphere forcing. So together, that's how we're gonna address the whole system. And then how does GDC do it? It measures the local environment around each of these spacecraft to measure the energy inputs and the atmospheric responses, the neutral gas, wind, temperature, density, and composition, and the same for the ionized gas. So we're measuring what does the energy come in, how does the atmosphere respond, and how does that energy get redistributed throughout the globe. So just to contextualize here, you know, we're looking at the ionosphere thermosphere system, and on the far left is a picture of the altitude profile of the temperature in the thermosphere and the plasma density in the ionosphere. And uh, you can sort of see this band where, that, where it says region of strongest coupling between say 300 and 400 kilometers. That's where GDC is focusing. And the reason for that is we have these two populations, the neutral gas, which extends up from the Earth's atmosphere and falls off exponentially, and the ionized gas, which comes from the neutral gas upon ionization by solar or magnetospheric inputs. And that really picks up around 100 kilometers and then peaks and then, then falls off. So there's a region where the neutrals dominate, that's below say two, two or 300 kilometers for the most part. And then above that, the ions dominate. And the interesting part from my standpoint is that region where they're both kind of co-dominant. We heard in an earlier talk today about how low latitudes, the wind drives the ions and the electric field. High latitudes, the electric field drives the ions and the wind. And so you get those kind of interesting exchanges of energy and momentum that are very variable in that region. For reference, it's about where the space station is located, maybe a little bit below. And uh, that's, that's basically the picture I want to show you. This is a nice uh, animation from Ilko Dorn. Oops. Let's see if I can go back. Maybe not. Ilko Dornbo said uh, to you, Delft, that um, I don't know if I can play it. Okay, maybe not. Anyway, it was a great, uh, it was a great animation. I there's, a, there's a URL there, so when you go and check this out, you can go look at that video. It shows on the left swarm measurements and AMI measurements of energy inputs, and on the right, a really fascinating simulation of how that energy input results in neutral density variations. And the amount of structure in that on the right is so, uh, is so striking that you would imagine, how can I ever study this? It's moving on such spatial and temporal scales that um, you really have to have a multi-scale observation system to understand both, both sides of this picture. And so GDC, in conjunction with ground-based measurements, in conjunction with modeling, in conjunction with other assets, which is one of the reasons we're here today to talk to CEDAR, is going to be trying to address that problem. And I want to point out the, really the need for other assets to work on this conjunction so that we can fully understand the system. How is GDC going to work just sort of conceptually? Uh, you have these multi-spacecraft, and they're flying on a single altitude, a single circular orbit. And you can take any three spacecraft and calculate an instantaneous gradient in latitude and longitude. If you then have a fourth or more spacecraft, you can take those kind of observations and look at the time variation as well. 
So we're gonna fly multiple spacecraft, in this case six spacecraft in varying configurations and the scale size over which they measure determines the scale size of the, of the system you can study. You can either sample it well, we saw pictures from Corwin earlier where you have to match to the sampling to the phenomena. Sometimes GDC will be matched to certain phenomena, sometimes it will be matched to larger scale phenomena and throughout the course of the mission we're essentially doing a scan or a survey over all those spatial and temporal scales so we can really uh, inform our future models. So what are the basics? Uh, GDC, I'm really excited to be here because it's the first NASA strategic mission in the ionosphere thermosphere in 20 years. We had timed, which is still going, still a great mission, you can get at that data uh, through some of the websites we've seen. Uh, and then before that, Dynamic Explorer, 20 years before that. So big missions like Parker Solar Probe, MMS, Solar Dynamics Observatory, those have been really focused on other parts of, of the geospace or heliosphere system. This is in the ITM, the first strategic mission in a long time, and we're really gonna be using this to build the community, uh, to really serve as an anchor point for the community to do CDAR and GEM goals, to do NASA goals, and so on. GDC is six identical observatories with the same set of instruments. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, we're gonna have a session on all the, and this and have some more detail here, but I just wanted to give you some touch points here to look at. Uh, Lila Anderson at CU LASP is running the ether instrument to measure plasma density, electron temperature. Dan Gershman at NASA Goddard is running the CAPE instrument, which measures the auroral particles, the electrons and ions. And Mehdi Bena at UMBC is measuring, is flying the mosaic instrument, which is an ion neutral mass spectrometer to measure composition, density, temperature, and wind of the ion and neutral gases. And we're gonna have a couple more instruments selected later this year, a magnetometer and instrument to measure thermal plasma. We have high inclination orbits, so similar to swarm, about 81 degrees. They're gonna be nearly circular in this altitude range and we expect to launch by the end of this decade. I wish I could be more specific, but we're just kind of sort of figuring everything out and, uh, and we're, we'll have something before the end of this decade. I think I can say that pretty confidently. We use onboard propulsion to keep things adjusted so that they can uh, maintain their respective sampling. We'll have a three-year prime mission and at least two additional years of operation we're currently planning for. And then finally, for those who are interested in space weather, GDC will carry a real-time broadcast capability to allow people to uh, to use that data for operational purposes. Here are some orbits, and the, the key point is that the GDC orbit evolves over time. So it starts out in the left-hand picture where the orbits are close together, the spacecraft are close together, and they're sampling on local scale gradients. Over time, the orbits evolve to a regional scale and then to a global scale. And so I, we have the ephemeris for this. You can download it, you can play with it, kind of understand how those missions will evolve. We are looking for input on that. We've got a certain set of ephemeris right now. If people can come to us and say, hey, to enable certain studies, if we could slightly tweak that to make it different, we would take that as input and be very interested in that. So I'll show you how to download that ephemeris at the end of the talk. Uh, we do really strongly want to coordinate with the ground-based community. The ground-based community is critical uh, for our understanding of the whole ITM system. And so that's one of the reasons I'm excited to be here at CDAR, is just to talk about how we can find synergy between what GDC is doing what the ground-based community wants to do and how we can leverage each other's work. In particular, tomorrow's special session, joint with GEM, from 4 to 6 p.m. is in this room, is going to be about this topic. How do people out there see GDC? How do you want to leverage GDC observations to do your science? And what capabilities will you all bring so we can all leverage together to do community work and, and really get the best out of the, out of the combined set of efforts? Um, what, another thing that I'm very excited about is this is the first sort of modern heliophysics mission with an open science policy from day one, the first strategic mission of that kind. So we really want to be doing with reproducible code. I'm very uh, going to have to learn myself about all the Python notebooks and everything else and how do we get that popular. But that's, that's built in, sort of baked into the beginning of the mission. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that this is a, you know, you have PI-led missions which are typically very focused and you have a certain set of goals you have to accomplish. Those work very well. But for these larger missions, what we'd like to do is have uh, a little bit more democratic structure where the community could have more points of engagement and dialogue and coordination. So this is led by NASA Goddard, but of course the critical efforts are being done by members of the community like yourselves, and we really want to have that be as open and democratic as possible. Finally, the thing I alluded to at the beginning of this talk was that we really see this as a way to rebuild, strengthen, recruit, and retain a NASA-funded community of ITM researchers. Almost all of the NASA, almost all the ITM funding right now comes from DOD, NSF, few other agencies. NASA has some, but we see uh, GDC as a really a way to increase that and really grow the pie so we can do some more, more work. Uh, let's see here. 
I'm going to skip this because I think we talked about it. Here are some of the institutions that are currently involved with GDC. I'd like to see your institutions on here if they're not already. Uh, we're going to be adding more institutions as we add the last two instruments and as we bring on future guest investigators and things like that. But, of course, these are the people who are getting paid by GDC to do the work, but the larger community will be much sort of, uh, you know, coordinating with GDC will be much larger than this as well. So I think uh, this is a pretty good cross-section, but we really want to expand it to be as broad across the community as we can. Most important is that tomorrow we're having this uh, community science mission, a uh, joint workshop tomorrow here in this room, 4 o'clock. Actually starts at 3.30 because Jem is starting a little bit earlier there on Hawaii time. And we'll have a WebEx there, and then we can stay here till 6 to have a sort of a brainstorming session on how we want to work together to, to make the best use of GDC data. There's a brand new Slack channel set up by Jeff Thayer and his team, uh, GDC Community, so you can join it there. And again, these slides will be available for you. And there's a, a workshop channel for tomorrow's workshop on that Slack just to discuss, ask questions, get information, and coordinate and collaborate. Here's how to get engaged. I want to really thank the CDAR community. Uh, there has been a really nice community statement of support for GDC issued in the last week or two, and the CDAR steering committee, I just really uh, appreciate your help in really organizing the community to provide that statement. Anyone who's interested in reading it can check it out there. Um, and then uh, we will have also at AGU sort of a workshop, both a session and a workshop to discuss where we want to go with GDC. Uh, and there's a few more links here in web pages. And then one thing I want to just put a plug in is we have this great NASA postdoctoral program. I came up through it. I know I see Jeff Cleansing in the back. He came through it. A bunch of other people have come through it. It's a really great opportunity to come to NASA for a couple of years, work on something. You're an independent researcher. We have multiple opportunities each year, March, July, and November. You basically write a short research proposal. You work with a mentor. And, uh, and then if you're selected, you can start and, and get to work on that. So here's a list of how to apply. There's an official website where you can go and search yourself and find your own mentors and project areas. I can also help coordinate that and connect you to people who might be in a, in a similar area to what you want. So, so please check that out. And then here are just some references for your use, uh, just for, for, future, uh, for, future, for future use for that. That's all I've got. And thank you so much for the time. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Rowland, for the exciting tutorial. Um, Dr. Rowland will also join us for the stu student lunch tomorrow. If you're interested, please have a seat and talk with him. Next, we have Dr. Chi Ting Xu giving a tutorial on data simulation. Chi Ting's demo code is also available on uh, Google Colab. Uh, it's published at the agenda, so if, uh, if you can check on the agenda, please open and also do a test run on your computer. So Dr. Chi Ting Xu is a postdoc researcher in the High Altitude Observatory at National Center for Atmospheric Research. She earned her PhD in space science from Graduate Institute, Institute of Space Science, National Center University, Taiwan. Her research interests include but not limited to space weather forecasting and data simulation for the upper atmosphere. And her current research topics is about thermospheric data simulation using WACAMAX and remote sensing data. Let's welcome Dr. Xu. So, hi everyone. Uh, this is Zhi Ting, and today I'm very grateful to have this opportunity um, to share some basic idea of data assimilation with you. So, in today's talk, I will just have a like a quick uh, introduction about data simulation. And after that, if we still have time, I will go through um, the code on Google Colab. So first of all, what is data simulation? So data simulation is a method that can optimally combine the observation information with um, prior state that come from model to get a posterior state. And first of all, let's simplify the question. So let's assume that if we just have a single point here, and then we would like to uh, know the true temperature of this single point. So what we can do is we can have a numerical model, um, and this model probably tell us that um, the temperature currently at this point is, let's say, 55 degree, uh, 55 degree, and we know that this model is 
not perfect. So I draw a blue line here to represent the model error. And similar to the observation, um, if we have an observation tell us that this point right now, the temperature is 65 degrees. And we also can use this red line to represent um, the observation arrow here. So assuming that everything is in normal distribution, and based on the blue part, which is the model information, we can have the probability density function as shown here for the true state. And if we only look at the information that provided by the observation, then we can have another probability density function of the true state. So now we know that the most possible uh, temperature is between 55 and 65 degree, right? And then you can combine these two information to get um, the most possible true state. So to find this black part, uh, we can either try to find the state with minimum variance, such as common filter, or you can try to find the most possible state, such as variational method. And uh, in today's talk, I will only focus on the common filter because we only have mid-limit time and um, common filter is easier to implement it in most uh, model. So here I just list the real update equation for the common filter. So XB is the prior state and XA is the posterior state and Y is your observation. And this equation tells us that your posterior state XA is equal to your prior state XB plus a term that related to the difference between observation and the prior state. And the K here is so-called the common gain, which is related to uh, the background error covariance that come from model, this one, and also the R, which is the observation error covariance. And you might notice that the arrow of this black part is smaller than the blue part and the red part because we have more information in this black part. So when we do the update, we also can update the variance PA, which is the analysis error covariance from PB as listed here. And now once we get this black part, we can um, use it as a new initial condition and put this back your your model to continue run your model. So the whole data assimilation experiment will look like this. First of all, at model time T0, um, we have um, state X 0B, and we use this as an initial condition to run the model to T1. And at this point, you have an observation which I represented as this yellow start. So I can assimilate this observation information into the system to update it to get X1A. After that, we can use this red dot as a new initial, condi new initial condition to continue run the model to T2. And then you can update the state again. So in this cartoon, we have uh, the prediction step and the update step. And one data assimilation cycle include uh, both, one both prediction step and the update step. So in this cartoon, we actually have two data assimilation cycle. And for the whole data assimilation period, we have to alternately run this two step. And here I list um, the equation that we use to do the update and the equation for the prediction step shown here. Um, the update equation are basically the same as the previous slide. And for the prediction um, part, the M here represent um, the forecast operator, which is um, basically your model. So now we have a general idea of um, what data, how data simulation work with common filter. And next, uh, I would like to show some um, example of how can we apply data assimilation to the global thermosphere ionosphere system. So first of all, um, this example shows um, data assimilation can help us to improve the space weather forecasting. So when we do the weather forecast, we need to let's say, understand the um, current state and use this current state to forecast the future state. 
And data assimilation can help us to get a better estimation of the current state. So this example, uh, we try to um, test the predictability of model TIE GCM with um, data, oops, was with the electron density data. So first of all, we assimilate the data into this model for 12 hour, then you can get a data assimilation result like at here. And then we use this as an initial condition and put it back to the TI region to do a free run for another 24 hour. And this different color represent um, different data assimilation setting. So you can see that in some settings, um, um, the data assimilation predictability can, oh, I mean, the TIUSM predictability can uh, longer, be longer than 24 hours. And next, uh, data and assimilation can also help us to uh, extend the usage of your observing system. So from some data that probably has data gap in space or in time, we can use the data simulation to uh, fill up the gap by incorporate model information into it. For example, here we have the ground-based GPS station, uh, ground-based GPS TEC data. And you can see that it's, we don't have much data over the sea surface. And what we can do is we um, assimilate it into the model TIEGCM to fill up the data gap. And after that, you can uh, get the data simulation result. Now you can see the um, global TEC map. The third part is that um, data simulation can also help us to um, get a better specification of upper atmosphere and further to invest uh, science investigation purpose. For example, if we have some state that hard to state in model that hard to be observed or lack of data, so what we can do is we assimilate data into those state that easy to be observed, and then this. Uh, this impact of data assimilation can further um, impact, uh, further uh, propagate to um, the state, those hidden state, to change the, uh, to get a better specification of this hidden state. For example, um, in this case, we want to understand the equatorial plasma drift uh, um, over um, experiment one month experiment period, and but we don't have enough data. So what we can do is. Uh, we assimilate the icon mighty wind data into the whole atmospheric model Wacom Max to change the wind specification in the Wacom Max. And this wind will further change the uh, specification of equatorial plasma drift in the uh, Wacom Max through the wind dynamo process. Okay, now um, I would like to use some time to uh, explain the, the Google Collab tool um, that uh, for the data assimilation. So this tool is designed for you to, people to understand um, how to run the data assimilation and how the whole experiment will look like. Uh, we use a small model called Lorenz model to do the data assimilation. The Lorenz model is a model that uh, includes three ordinary differential equations and it's very sensitive to your initial condition. For example, uh, if we, this is two Lorentz model run uh, with, for their X, Y, Z component that change with time, and the red line and blue line are two run with two different initial conditions listed here. You can see that there's only a 1% difference in the Z component, but after a few time steps, the behavior of the red line and the blue line are completely different. And this is um, the result in the X, Y, Z space. So basically they are the same, but uh, you can see the butterfly pattern. And um, of course the data assimilation method used here is um, the common filter. And I have to mention that this call, in this call we are not going to update the any term that related to the analysis error covariance and background error covariance. We try to simplify the code with any, uh, many assumptions. Um, so please don't just use it for your own uh, research purpose because 
uh, is not a complete update. And to run this code, first of all, you will need to set up two initial conditions. One will be the one that used for the true run. This true run will be used to generate some observation, synthetic observation. Um, and the other one will be the one that we are going to do data assimilation. Next, we also need to set up some observing, uh, observation error covariance and the sampling frequency. The sampling frequency is used to determine the time interval uh, of two observations. And then you can generate some observation from the truth. You will see that the truth will be, uh, uh, sorry, the observation will be a bit offset from the truth um, because of the observation error covariance. And then you can, you also have to set up the background error covariance. Now we can do the data assimilation. So um, the blue dashed line is the result of data assimilation. The purpose of this tool is to bring um, the, the blue dashed line closer to the black line. And the green line showing here is a nature run that with the same initial condition as the blue dashed line but without any uh, impact of data assimilation. So by comparing the blue line and the green line, uh, we can see the impact of data assimilation. So I think we have some time, so let's um, have a quick look of this code. Okay, so first of all, you will need to import the Python package, and then you can start to uh, set up these two initial conditions and run the Lorentz model. This don't work. And after that, um, here you have to set up your background error covariance and also the um, observation error covariance and the sampling frequency. Okay, and the third, step, third step is to generate an animation for the data assimilation result. So the data assimilation result will look like this. The black line is the truth, and the blue line is the data assimilation result, and this red dot are uh, your observation. So, okay, let's play the animation. So you can see the, in each data assimilation cycle um, how the data assimilation bring the bring up blue line to the black line. And I also plot out the rooming square arrow between this black line and the uh, blue line as showing in this, the bottom plot. And the green line here is the rooming square arrow between the true state and the nature run. So you should see that um, the rooming square arrow of this green line would be most, in most of the time, it will be larger than the black line. Okay. So I think that's it, thank you. Thank you, Zhi Ting, for the wonderful talk. Uh, next, we have Dr. Michael Hirsch joining us virtually to give a tutorial on ionospheric dynamics modeling at local scales and beyond. Dr. Michael Hirsch is a research scientist at Boston University Center for Space Physics. His research focuses on re remote sensing and mod modeling of ionospheric dynamics, uh, including aurora and space weather impacts on mission cr uh, critical infrastructure. Dr. Hirsch has made extensive uh, software contributions to geospace software and universally used software programs, including Python, CMake, LaPack, NumPy, SciPy, AstroPy, and dozens more. That is, he contributed code used inside these fundamental, uh, fundamental programs themselves, not just as a user of the packages. Let's welcome Dr. Hirsch. Say in a brief background, uh, Matt Zettergren, who many of you know, uh, has developed this model, I think, over more than a decade. Uh, initially prototyped it in MATLAB and uh, 
and then uh, went on to develop it uh, nearly completely in Fortran. And today, uh, more recently, we're adding uh, C and C++ interfaces. So that kind of whatever language uh, or scripting language you like to work in, uh, we, we can interface with it. So um, as many of the other tutorials today have established or been talking about, you know, anospheric dynamics are of uh, general interest to our community. Among other things, is an important aspect uh, interface between uh, the magnetosphere and uh, the Earth. Um, well-established models cover a range of scales. Gemini 3D's uh, focus is covering ionospheric dynamics. Now, initially, it was focused on local and, and regional uh, phenomena, um, sort of down to 10 gyro, gyro radii on up. Um, and basically, the limit was computer memory and runtime. So, uh, you know, if you're on your laptop that uh, has four CPU cores, uh, and uh, well, I guess you know you can run it for a week or two, but uh, eventually, you know, <laughs> eventually you're gonna want your laptop back to do something else. Uh, so maybe you'll use it on an HPC or something, but you can certainly, we've always kept the goal that you can prototype on your laptop. Um, you know, you can run a sort of a small 2D or a 2D simulation or a small 3D simulation. Uh, and then before you go to HPC, so you're not having to wait in queue and find, oops, my simulation crashes because I didn't set something up. You can test it quickly, run a few time steps on your laptop as long as you have enough memory and then um, put it to the, sorry, put it to the HPC. So yeah, with uh, HPC and, and work that Matt has done uh, in the past year or so, we can scale up, uh, you know, beyond hundreds of CPU cores to thousands of CPU cores, perhaps even 10,000 or more uh, for the largest uh, HPCs. Um, so not so naturally in such a simulation as I'm hinting, you can configure the grid uh, to your heart's content, uh, and, but you also can turn on and off aspects of the model physics. So if uh, you're looking to model, maybe looking to work with GPS, GNSS data, you're looking to uh, model continent-wide uh, dynamics, and you're maybe just interested mostly in TEC, total electron content, and you're not inter interested in generating all these other data. Well, some, some of the, uh, the physics will still be in there, but you don't have to output you know, terabytes of data files that you don't need. You can sort of select and only output the things that you need. Um, so it's also amenable to running on cloud services like Colab, AWS, et cetera. Um, uh, you would probably be best served. You can compile it directly on those services, but you might be better served because, you know, in, in the stateless nature of those services, rather than compiling over and over again, every time you want to use a simulation, you might download, you know, compile once a binary, perhaps uh, from our service, and then uh, download that binary to your cloud instance and use it there. Um, so the basic structure here is, is on the right. You, uh, you know, minimally, you need to make a text file input. Uh, and you'd set things like, you know, date and time, how long you want the simulation to run, the resolution, which grid type. Um, if you're, uh, you know, doing something where you want to use your own data, like maybe you're trying to simulate uh, polar cap patches or unusual temperatures or winds or things like that, you can also specify your own input data in HDF5 format. Um, and then most typically one would use our scripting interfaces to sort of generate an initialization state for the simulation. It has to have uh, a starting point and a, a sort of, I don't say a reference ionosphere, but sort of a starting ionosphere. Now this ionosphere naturally won't uh, necessarily be self-consistent with the way that Gemini models the world. So what you usually do is you'll say, okay, run the simulation for a period of time, let the uh, discontinuity settle out and then Gemini will have then uh, have a self-consistent uh, ionosphere that it can work with. So as, as shown here on the right, we have uh, a, a text file, INI file, possibly data, optional HDF5 data files, uh, use the PyGemini interface, Python interface to generate the initialization data. And then um, typically we, you don't have to use MPI. You can, you know, for debugging purposes or diagnostic, you can run it without in a single core, single process. But again, that usually becomes a time constraint where it will take you a long time to run any kind of simulation that has hundreds of cells or more. Uh, so most typically we've used MPI. You can use any of the uh, modern MPI libraries, uh, you know, Intel, MPI, CH, Open MPI, et cetera, Microsoft MPI, and that will then uh, control the execution of Gemini 3D workers. Uh, and that will output HDF5 files currently just to keep the size of data manageable for, well, for not just currently, for a long time, we've been uh, outputting one HDF5 file per time step. So the data from all the workers, so you have 10 workers, 100, 1,000 workers, all that data is combined uh, via the MPI layer into a single HDF5 file per time step. Like I say it's just the easy to digest size um, 
And then again, you would probably want to look at that. Maybe you'd use your own scripts. We have, we provide uh, scripts to plot uh, the data and you can customize those to your heart's content. And uh, as I was mentioning in the prior slide, you can switch on and off all sorts of models. Uh, we have interfaces for H HWM, the horizontal wind model, MSIS, um, neutral atmosphere, uh, climatological model GLOW, which uh, models um, kinetics of aurora and air glow, uh, photo ionization, things like that. Um, it's just a matter, of, again, those, as you turn more and more things on, more model fidelity on, including the external models, it'll slow down the computation. So you can configure that uh, as necessary. We have Cartesian curvilinear grids. Uh, in the coming months, uh, we anticipate having adaptive grid mesh refinement, which will be a real uh, enhancement, but uh, that will be, you know, perhaps we'll discuss that uh, in a few months. Um, so one of the early questions is when we were uh, got funded by NASA HDE is why don't you use uh, MPI for Pi or some of the Python MPI interfaces? Well, um, our model, yes, while we can run on the user laptop, is it typically we want to run on a large computing platform, HPC platform. So um, what you want, the typical model there, as I was hinting at the, at the prior slide, is that you configure the simulation, send it off somewhere to run. Maybe it runs for, you know, 100,000, uh, 10,000 CPU hours, 100,000 CPU hours, whatever, something, some large amount on a remote system. And then you uh, collect that data and maybe plot it. Now, if it's too big to plot in your laptop, you could plot it on the HPC. However, that works. Our scripts, uh, uh, as far as we know, scale well to various sizes where you can uh, in, uh, sort of downsample the data, right? You don't want to have like a 10,000, or maybe, well, maybe you do, but if you don't, if you don't want a 10,000 by 20,000 pixel plot, you can downsample the data appropriately, at least for preview purposes. And again, we use the script that we chose to do this sort of this hybrid software where the input and output are handled by scripted languages such as MATLAB or Python. And while the computation is done when C++ and Fortran, um, because the input output is typically what most users change, um, but it is, you know, as I uh, will has, uh, has have uh, said, uh, the code is broken up into functions so that more advanced users um, you can write your own functions. We've tried to isolate things so it's not this huge monolithic code that you can uh, sort of, oh, I want to change how the collisions work. Like maybe I want to make the model simpler, or you want to make it more advanced, or you want to swap something else in for collisions, uh, or whatever potential computations, you can do that uh, without disturbing the rest of the model. We've really, um, and Matt in particular, has worked hard uh, to really modularize things. Um, so here, yeah, just some typical specs here that, uh, yeah, you can run it on a, you can literally run it on a Raspberry Pi. That was just sort of a reference platform I used for something as sort of being a uh, minimal computing platform uh, that, you know, one, one gigabyte of a Raspberry Pi, you can run it on up to, you know, as large HPCs and stuff. Um, oh, we did, uh, you know, uh, add milestoning so that maybe you uh, thought, you know, on an HPC, you, you specify a time for how, how long you're going to run, and maybe you underestimated by, and uh, you don't have to lose the whole simulation uh, every so many time steps, which is user configurable. You can user configure uh, to say, oh, yeah, you can restart from a point, or maybe you uh, decide, oh, this is looking interesting. Maybe you have a simulation you've already run, and you want to say, hey, I want to go back, uh, you know, 20% of the way through the simulation, I want to do something else. I want to introduce, you know, uh, some temperature anomaly or density anomaly. You can do that. You're not always starting from scratch each time. Um, yeah. So historically, as I mentioned, Gemini itself was developed in MATLAB, um, and so uh, for various reasons, legacy reasons, because it's been over a decade of development. Um, when when Python wasn't as well established and universal as it is today in geospace, uh, MATLAB was uh, was used, uh, and it still can be used, but uh, for the past two years, we've been doing primarily develop, develop, development in Python, although MATLAB is still there. And like I say, some groups prefer MATLAB. And so there's some things we have, like some examples and things that are only in MATLAB and others are only in Python, but it's pretty easy to switch back and forth. Uh, you can even run, you know, just generally with, and in general, you can run MATLAB scripts from Python and Python scripts from MATLAB. There's some efficiency downsides to that, but you know, if it's something you, you can just try it out quickly. If you really like it, you can sort of, uh, the syntax is similar enough between NumPy uh, that and uh, that we use in in uh, PyGemini and MATLAB that you can uh, port it over like any other program. Um, so I don't have any just for time constraints today. I didn't show the notebooks, but uh, I have other examples that we can uh, discuss if you like uh, offline. Uh, I have you know the MATLAB notebook feature, and I've seen actually people some people using MATLAB's notebooks, and of course Jupyter notebooks, which are perhaps more widely used in our community. And again, and then the key there is, you know, the, to use those in the cloud, Google, Google Colab and things is that um, 
you know, you can build it. If we have enough time or someone on this, I can show you, yes, I, I can build the whole thing within Google Colab itself, but it takes several minutes to do that. And then like every time you log, if you, unless you have Google Colab Pro, every time you log out, the instance is erased and you have to do it again. So the quicker thing to do would be to like, you know, probably in about one second, you can download the binary executable already, you know, one second versus five minutes of compiling and uh, you don't have to recompile every time. Um, so as I mentioned, right, you can scale from a two by two grid. I'm not sure there'd be a lot of use for that, but I guess if you did have a use for a two by two <laughs> grid, you get up to as large as you want within RAM. Um, so yeah, we discussed these uh, typical uh, constraints. Um, we've to sort of work with, you know, thinking about uh, long-term reproducibility of science. So this is a bit indirect, but um, I, I've, I've been a reviewer on papers and perhaps you have too, even you know, modern papers where they're good about sharing codes. Sometimes the setups are so arcane. I've sat there for maybe uh, two or three hours till I say, okay, this is a bit much, right? Trying to set up the GPU. I, and I have I have the appropriate hardware and operating system, but it's, it's really hard to set up and you need particular versions of CUDA and things like that. Uh, or the uh, CUDA toolbox and things. Now that's uh, some of that's just part of the way it is to do GPU computing. We don't, uh, we aren't using GPUs at the moment, but so anyway, it is an effort to keep this sort of, you know, for our, our own reduction of effort and to, to ease use across sort of any platform, whether you're on a Cray supercomputer or your laptop or Raspberry Pi or whatever you want to use, we use standards conforming uh, C and C++ and Fortran throughout. Um, now that doesn't mean, right, that doesn't mean it's going to work the way you want, right? Assuming even your algorithm is correct, there's an issue of the compilers uh, don't always, right? They have plenty of bugs too. They're very complicated programs and, uh, right, there's, you know, hundreds and thousands in, uh, of bugs in them. So uh, we've uh, reported, uh, gotten some fix, several bugs in GCC as well as the uh, Intel compilers and Intel's been, uh, the Intel uh, compiler team has been great about responding pretty quickly. Uh, we get, you know, the next release fixing the issues we find. Yeah, so Mac OS, Linux, Windows, et cetera. Um, uh, so for reliability as well as performance, uh, we have uh, scripts that build all the numeric libraries and, and all as well as HDF5. And we even go as far as, you know, this is just something and we're happy to share this with other, with other projects, it's all open source. We can even build, you know, the GCC compiler suite, uh, Python itself, you know, C Python executables, uh, MPI libraries. Uh, we have scripts that'll do that all. Um, and right, of course, you could always just do it yourself. But I'm saying these are like, you know, one step scripts. You don't have to like, you know, dig through auto tools and stuff. You could just, you know, one command will say, oh, okay, your Python's too old. Okay, you can download Python. Or let's say you're in an environment where, you know, with Anaconda's, Anaconda's uh, license change in the past year or so, where some uh, institutions feel they can't use it because they need per seat licenses or whatever. So if you're at a place where you, you can't use Anaconda Python or whatever, you have issues getting it, we can compile it from source. You have some issues, restrictions on compilers and you have to compile your own compiler. We have the scripts you can <laughs> compile the GCC compiler suite, you know, sort of one step commands. So uh, that you, you don't have to fiddle with that yourself. Just uh, one, one command will do it. Um, so we work, you know, the current Current oldest supported GCC is actually GCC. Uh, I think we're up to GCC nine now, or maybe it's actually GC. I think recently they deprecated GCC nine, where GCC ten is actually officially the oldest supported, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So Python three seven and a couple of year old MATLAB. MATLAB has made a lot of improvements uh, in the past few years, which is why I don't support super old MATLAB um, directly. Um, I think for time also I might uh, instead of doing the terminal commands or the notebooks, I may just show the plots from this. Uh, but this is something if you want offline, you can click and get that script and uh, run the simulation. Maybe I'll just skip ahead to show the plots. And if someone wants to see it run, you know, just it's cutting and pasting a couple of commands. You know, I guess everybody sort of run the notebooks. Um, one of the things is that that's called out, and this is again a general technique used in such programs, is we use one environment variable, Gemini root arbitrary name. What it is is that across all our scripts, that lets you tell all the scripts where you've installed Gemini to. Um, the issue is, is, right, if you want to spend five or 10 minutes to compile it every time you can, but usually you'd like to save that time. So this is kind of a way, kind of a rose, I don't know, not a Rosetta Stone, but a little, a little pointer that says, uh, and to say to all the programs, hey, here's where Gemini is, look, look to this. Oh, yeah, that is, uh, this link does show sort of uh, an example of building it. And I said, oh, yeah, this takes several minutes and it gets erased when I close it. So uh, one of the things I, I know a prior speaker mentioned, X-Ray, we were one of the early users of that. Even back when it was X-Ray, before it was X-Ray, we were using it back then on HDF5 and we use PNG files. So 
you know, the plots typically you're going to have, you know, hundreds of plots, maybe even thousands of plots. You don't want to pop up all those windows on the screen. So uh, we do that right directly to PNG files. This is just an example of a simple, this runs in about uh, 10 seconds on a tablet computer. This is just two time steps. Uh, they're about one second apart, electron number density and uh, electron temperature. And so in one, uh, yeah, in about one second here in this 2D grid, this is a slice, um, an east-west simulation. Uh, we see some of the, you know, and, and you might say, well, what, you know, your simulation time step is too big. Well, yeah, the simulation time step is much, much smaller than this. I think it's maybe a factor, maybe of a hundred smaller than this, uh, and it's dynamic. So it's, it's sort of checking, there's some uh, work that's been done to sort of make sure you're not stepping, you know, needlessly fine or, or aliasing in time because you're stepping too coarsely. Um, okay, so this is the final slide here, and I know we're going to go to the general question session. So just saying it's a community model. We uh, have over 20 repositories associated with it under Gemini 3D, as well as some others. And I've tried to make these libraries, you know, these are things that you could use in your own program, uh, maybe, you know, um, in terms of if you want to, hey, I want to be able to, you know, build Python or GCC or build these libraries. This is all, I've tried to, again, sort of segment things and make them as reusable as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we have the lightning round Q&A, um, and we will start with our first question. Our first question is to Dr. Harding. Um, Dr. Harding, Mighty looks at different ranges and altitudes at the view line for each altitude bin. How do you attribute errors? Okay. Okay, so there's not really just one error that works for all the altitudes. Um, what you really want is, uh, you know, a covariance matrix, because errors could be correlated across altitudes. Um, so I guess the short answer is there's a separate one for each altitude, and if you really want to do your st statistics right, use a covariance matrix. Um, read that's in the documentation, and also I'm happy to um, chat with you about your case if you want any help. We have one more. Um, what are some techniques to solve the vertical range smearing issues in interpreting interpreting optical air glow triangulation from multiple instruments as well. Yeah, so I mean that's a one answer. Um, with one with one imager, of course, you can't do it without assumptions, which may or may not be right for your instrument. Um, with multiple instruments, yeah, you can triangulate, but that's only possible in some conditions. Like if you have some discrete thing, like a small. Uh, you know, auroral arc that you can triangulate from multiple measurements. But if you're just trying to generally re reconstruct a 3D picture from 2D images, that's, you know, you need to use some tomography. I feel like a lot of people have tried that. Um, I tried that. It's very difficult. You need really well calibrated uh, imagers in both space and time. Uh, I, th I think it's Josh Semeter has a paper that he did that successfully, so you might want to check that out. Thank you, Dr. Harding. Next, um, we have questions for Dr. Roland. So Dr. Roland, you said that we students might be helping run the GDC mission in 10 years. What's the best way to get involved now? Great, thanks for the question. Yeah, we're just getting started, so this is a great time to get on the ground floor. Do science that's in GD relevant, GDC relevant. Come to all the sessions at CDAR, AGU, et cetera. Um, and also, you know, we're gonna be starting things like a student collaboration. Just keep your eyes open for that, we'll be advertising it. I think there's a lot of data sets like SWARM and ground-based data sets which would be directly relevant. Start writing papers on those topics and you'll just naturally get kind of pulled in to the science, I think. And then if you have at your institution, many of you will have at your institution, scientists working in this project, talk to them, get involved. And we can also facilitate that through the NASA side as well. Thank Perfect. You. I think we'll have one more question for you, if you don't mind. <laughs> hey, no worries. Um, what do we expect to get from GDC? Um, more about data gaps or more about knowledge gaps? We're going to get both. It's about a two orders of magnitude improvement in our coverage of the IT region. But really, the reason we get the data is not to get the data. It's to get the, the knowledge and the science. So we have new kinds of measurements, things like spatial and temporal gradients we've never had before, detailed comprehensive measurements of the inputs and the outputs. And so I think, you know, I'll leave it to you to, to define some of the science questions we're going after in the next decade. but. 
there are a list of science questions in the SCDT report. There's a lot of open knowledge gaps there. It's in the references and the slides that I sent. So check out that report and just sort of see what those science objectives are, and you'll see where we're going to be focusing. Perfect. Thank, Thank you so much. All right. Next, we have Dr. Sue. How do we do you determine your initial state? Um, and part two to that is how do you, if the posterior is uni or multimodal? Um, so I think I'm not 100% sure about your second question, but I can quickly uh, answer the first question. Um, I think you're talking about um, the posterior state, um, initial state at very beginning. So just like most modeler, we can run um, the model for like a couple of days or months to get a steady state before we start the data simulation. All right, cool. And we'll have a second question for you. Um, could you be more specific about how you combine the ground observations with the TIE GCM to a complete global map? Okay, um, so actually um, the background error covariance that I show in here is not a single value. It's a very complete large matrix that can determine the uh, estimate the correlation uh, between each model single point. So we do have the information of um, how, um, the, how the correlation between like this different model point, and then we can use that to do the um, update. All right, thank yep. you so much. You. Um, our final um, set of questions is for Dr. Hirsch. What are the basic outputs ionospheric parameters of Gemini 3D? Dr. Hirsch. Number density, ion temperature, electron temperature. There are other numerous other derived outputs. You can get uh, sort of magnetic field perturbations, things like that. But sort of think of it like the ISR quantities. Um, so with the associated models like GLOW, you can also get uh, um, auroral intensity or air glow intensity. Um, so it's sort of, yeah, those are, but those are sort of things like the ISR quantities, plus you can derive things, plus whatever external models you might be using. Okay, perfect. One more question. Um, how could students get involved in further developing the Gemini model? Um, well, we're on GitHub, you know, github.com slash Gemini 3D. Um, and we have we do get pull requests from students, you know, requesting changes. Or if you have um, something you like, we have uh, you know you can open a GitHub issue, or we have GitHub discussions turned on, uh, or you can uh, email. I think I forgot to put my email address in the slides actually, but uh, I'll uh, I'll update the slides with my email address in there. Uh, we're happy to or you know uh, happy to talk with you. Yeah, we get some sometimes you know we don't we, you know if it's something big we might need to say well we'll have to you know, work on a grant proposal for that. Um, but if it's something small, maybe we can work, sort of collaborate with you uh, online. All right, perfect. Thank you so much to all of the speakers. If any of the remaining questions, they'll all be answered in the student newsletter. Um, now we have a short break and we'll meet back here at 345.